Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Linda Sonnen, Manager of Public Programs at Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, the Board of Directors, staff, and volunteers, I am honored to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn. This program, uh, Bravery and Grit, the Big Red One in World War II, is part of the museum's Liberation 2020 series, Voices of the Liberator, the Liberated, and the Lost, a series dedicated to reflecting on the legacy of the Holocaust and World War II. I'd like to thank all of our Liberation 2020 partners listed on our opening slides for their continued support. It is now my honor to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Kruinsky A. Salter. Dr. Salter is the United States Army Colonel retired and serves as the First Division Museum's Executive Director. He is also a guest associate curator and military subject matter expert at the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, where he curated the permanent inaugural exhibition titled Double Victory, the American the African American Military Experience. Dr. Salter serves on the Army Historical Foundation Board of Directors and is an accomplished author, contributing author and editor to several books, including The Story of Black Military Officers, 1861 to 1948. He has worked on two documentaries, serving as the associate producer and senior historian for the United States Army's documentary, Unsung Heroes, the Story of America's Female Patriots, and has appeared on several national and local broadcast media outlets. Dr. Salter has taught military history at the United States Military Academy at West Point, military strategy at the Command and General Staff College in Leavenworth, military leadership at Howard University, Washington, DC, and African American history at several other institutions as an adjunct professor. Dr. Salter, we are honored and thrilled to have you with us today. I turn the program over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Linda. Let me know when you want me to uh, put my slides up and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, please, go ahead. Okay, let me see if I can work technology in this new environment. <laughs> I know we scheduled this before the pandemic, but uh, First of all, I've done several of these so far. Is my volume and uh, video coming through pretty good? The slides, Linda? Yes, sir. We're good to okay, go. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's kind of hard to do these virtual programs because you do not get the immediate uh, feedback that you get when you are in person. And, uh, and you, you, you just move forward. So I'm going to... Uh, do this just like I would do if I were in a class. Uh, it's called Lunch and Learn. And uh, I prepare myself a little bit extra because it's lunch and learn and hopefully I can impart uh, some additional knowledge. I was initially asked to speak about the 1st Infantry Division and then, you know, pare it down to the 1st Infantry Division in World War II, but I wanted to package it a little more. I always try to tailor my presentations to the institution that invites me in the audience. So um, the 1st Infantry Division has a direct connection to uh, labor camps and the Nuremberg trials, so I'm going to end with that. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go through the first several slides real quickly because I do want to introduce you to our museum and the 1st Infantry Division and how it started. Uh, that will be maybe about seven or eight minutes, and then we'll spend uh, maybe about seven or eight minutes uh, the first part of World War II, and then we'll spend a little bit more time uh, when we get to the Battle of the Bulge, which begins in December of 1944, and we'll go through post-war into the Nuremberg trials and talk about some of that. And I'll do my best to wrap up about uh, uh, 40, 45 after, and hopefully I can see a, a clock here. 
and uh, take some questions. I do have to sign off right at 1245 because I'm right up against a one o'clock. Um, so let me make sure. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. So basically just the beginning. Some of you have been out here and normally I would ask how many people have been to Cantini and you know, get a few hands. So my assumption is that some of you have been out here and if you speak French, you know we don't pronounce it the French way. We do pronounce it Cantini. Uh, but in the beginning, uh, the longtime editor and owner of the uh, Chicago Tribune, um, who had taken over in 1910, decided that he wanted to be a soldier. In World War I, it was not uncommon for people at all echelons of life uh, to, uh, to join the military and serve the country. And so you see Robert R. McCormick as an editor at the top and as a soldier at the bottom. So he does go. Uh, and serve, and he's in the historic uh, Big Red One, the first infantry division. And uh, when he leaves, uh, he leaves uh, his family estate called Red Oak Farm. Uh, he was so touched and moved by his service with soldiers that he named that Cantini Park, um, that he named it Cantini, I should say. And when he passed away in 1955 in his will, uh, in perpetuity to all the other stuff that we have out here, he actually said there will be a museum uh, dedicated to mili military history, and so we tell the story of the first ID. And so you're just looking at the intro of our museum when you get to World War I, so come out and see us. We can talk more about World War I, but let me share with you um, our new mission, vision, and tagline statement. So some of you who have not been here in the last year, I had the fortunate, uh, the good fortune to become the uh, director last April, uh, did some revamping of the mission and the vision statement to expand our story. So let me just talk about the mission statement really quick and just point out the key phrase in there starting at the second line. You know, we're gonna tell military history through the lens of the Army's first infantry division. And what does that mean? Well, when you go down to the vision statement, and the vision statement says, by dedicating ourselves to interpreting a more inclusive Big Red One story, reflecting the diversity of our military, uh, that's what I wanted to do, put more stories in this museum that reflects the inclusivity and the diversity of our nation. And so uh, that is a woman named Frances Gulick. Uh, she is like many other women uh, who supported the first ID during World War I. She was in the YWCA and the key thing, hopefully you can see my pointer, she wears the big red one patch, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we can also uh, tell stories of Asian Pacific Americans and Native Americans. The gentleman you see in the middle, uh, that's uh, Tomas Claudio, a Filipino American. He was not an American citizen during World War I, but he served in the Big Red One and was uh, killed in action in 1918. Um, on the top right is um, Charles Shea, who was a Native American medic in the Big Red One who landed on D-Day. Uh, we're interpreting more stories about hyphenated Americans in World War I. Hyphenated Americans was a big deal in that era. Uh, we mostly dropped the hyphenation uh, in today's America. And Native Americans served integrated throughout the force. A lot of us know about the different code talking units, but Native Americans also served as an integral force in throughout the force. And World War II, we are adding more stories about women. So not going to go into detail about the image you probably see on the right. That's the 688. Yes, those are African American women who supported the first ID in getting mail in 1945. And of course, the war could not have been won without the Women's Army Corps. So we have found those stories with that great connection of how women back home and overseas did their part and some of the direct connections of uh, not only Women Army Corps folks, but nurses. And then last but not least, uh, the first ID was one of those 12 divisional size elements in World War II, which towards the end of the war had these integrated platoons of African-Americans. A lot of people have never heard of the fifth platoon. There were African-Americans uh, who took reduction in ranks in order to serve as infantrymen uh, as a part of some of the uh, infantry uh, divisions. 
and the first ID was one of those divisions. And so when we say a more inclusive story through the lens of the first ID, that's what we mean. Uh, and just very quickly, so let me take you through, uh, and Linda, we're in a class, so am I going too fast? How is the pace? Doing great, thank Doing you. Great. Okay, good. Okay, and so let me just, before we get to the Battle of the Bulge, you know, so the first ID, you know, first in war in World War I, among the first, if not the first in World War II, they are in action uh, in 1942. So when you come to the museum, this is an interpretation from our Mediterranean gallery in the museum, and it takes you step by step from um, Operation Torch when they landed in North Africa in 1942 and they fight across North Africa for 9, 10, 11 months, meet with the British, and then they go on and they fight in uh, Operation Torch. Now let me explain real quickly what Operation Husky and Torch were. They were invasions, ladies and gentlemen, beach invasions. That's very key uh, when we get to the, uh, the next slide. Uh, but come and visit us, and you can see uh, a lot of our interpretations, which gives you, in a few words, um, you know, what the first ID does in North Africa and Sicily. Why don't they fight in Italy? Because they're the big red one. They're selected to go to England, and they spent about seven months in England doing what? Preparing for D-Day. So when you see... D-Day, June 6, 1944, and the invasion of Normandy, and the Big Red One being one of the two American divisions leading uh, the way, the 29th Division was the other division. The Big Red One, this is their third invasion, and that's what a lot of people really don't conceptualize uh, when you don't look at the big picture. And there are a few, a few soldiers, and we'll talk about one, uh, who actually make it through the entire war. They are three invasion soldiers. And just think about that when you th think about um, World War II and all the battles and actions they participated in. The two images you're looking at, uh, what I wanted to do is, uh, of course, introduce you to our museum. Uh, we are an immersive gallery from World War I to the Vietnam gallery. So when you go into World War I, you go through a trench. When you get to Vietnam, you go through a jungle. When you're in our D-Day gallery, you are immersed on D-Day. So for those of you who have been here, you know what we're talking about. And by the way, we open this Friday. I know the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center opens tomorrow. Uh, we open on Friday. Uh, you can get the uh, free passes online because we have a limit limitation. I'm sorry, Linda, a few plugs along the way. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you can come in and get a great sense of what D-Day was about. And what you're looking at on the right side is a German bunker, you know, talk about that immersive experience. So when you go through the German bunker, um, and then, dude, I was trying to get something off my slide. I can't see what's over here, but on this side, you go through the bunker, keep your eye on that particular interpretation. That's where we're going to go next. So. This is where I want to spend more time after D-Day. So after D-Day, um, what uh, the first ID does and the buildup of American forces is now they do the, what we call the breakout and pursuit. So when you look through that bunker and you're going through, that's the interpretation you see. So from June 6th, for about six weeks, the American forces are bottled up, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Bocage, uh, getting through that terrain, the German defenses. So we do get a foothold on the beaches, but it's very hard to break through. But like they finally break through the Phalus Gap, uh, break through the Bocage, and then it's a race across uh, Germany pursuing the German army. This is a point where we almost had the opportunity to destroy the German army, but we were not able to destroy the German army. You can see we're an allied force. Uh, other nations uh, fighting alongside, but you can see the route of the first ID. And this is what happens for the next six months, where you see my pointer, it's the Battle of the Bulge, and that's where we're going to go next. And this is where I'm going to kind of put on my uh, military historian hat from my West Point days at Command and General Staff College. I taught strategy at Howard University. I taught leadership 
um, at uh, the military um, academy, you do a lot of tactics. So hopefully I won't put some of you guys to sleep when I talk about the Battle of the Bulge, but I thought it would be nice to talk a little bit about one of the battles in more detail. And since D-Day gets a lot of the coverage a lot of times, let's look at the Battle of the Bulge. So the pursuit and breakout. So now let's spend some time on the map. So hopefully you can see my pointer. Linda, can you guys see my pointer when I'm moving it? We sure can. Right. Come. And so that's over here where you see the big red one. That's this area right here. And so what happens for that six months that we just talked about, the first ID moves across Germany, and this is where they are on the front line. So that's the other thing I always like to talk about. You know, they're one of about 40, uh, 50 infantry size and armor size divisions in Europe. And so this is where the first infantry division is uh, stationed. Uh, November, December of 1944, we pursued the Germans. Uh, the Germans can't fight anymore, <clears throat> so we believe. And then there's this breakthrough, the Battle of the Bulge. The Germans have this last ditch effort to break through and to get into their supply lines and they need fuel um, and they want to get, I'm going to back up really quick because I want to show you something. Um, this is kind of their target. There's a place called Antwerp. I won't spend a lot of time. A lot of us know Antwerp is a, is a port. So the Battle of the Bulge, they're trying to get to Antwerp, which on this map, which would be under this star. And on the last map where you saw the first ID, you see all of these divisions. The first infantry division is right at the neck of the bulge. So during the Battle of the Bulge, they are in a key position during this fight. And they stand and they fight there for the next month from roughly mid-December to mid-January, uh, keeping the Germans from breaking through on this front. And there are three other divisions, as you can see, uh, on this particular front. So we talk about this magnitude of forces along the front. Let's just now what I call a necking down exercise. And let's just look at this area right here. So when you come into the museum, um, you know, we have obviously the interpretation of the Battle of the Bulge. So this map, and I won't go into detail, but if you want to come and get some uh, down and dirty details about what happens at the Battle of the Bulge and Medal of Honor recipients, um, this map talks about it. And it is that area this location. Now, I have a few things I'm going to, uh, I want to read. I'm not going to read this particular interpretation because I want to say more time when I get to Falkenau and the Nuremberg trials. But, you know, this was one of the most horrific winters, uh, the worst winters in Germany. Uh, men died because they were wounded and they froze to death. That is just how cold it was and how much snow uh, was coming down. And in fact, um, it took several days into the battle before the atmosphere and the cloud level cleared for the Allies to get um, air support. So the Battle of the Bulge is that last big battle that the Americans and the Allied forces have to stand with the first ID bent at the neck of the Bulge to make sure that we can bring the Third Reich to a defeat. And, you know, not to insult anyone's intelligence, uh, just in case some of us don't know, uh, the Battle of the Bulge does get its name because the Germans are able to have this success and create this bulge. But the Allies uh, stand strong and they come back and they, um, they, they push that bulge back. But this is a slide, I forget the different slides I have. So, I, I want to show you our museum as well. So when you go into that section, the map that you see right here, that's the map right there in front of this uh, M4 tank. We have an M4 tank in, in, in the gallery, ladies and gentlemen. You can come up close and personal. Of course, you can come to our, our tank park. Uh, it's been whitewashed recently. It used to be uh, green, but uh, what I wanted to do and what we wanted to do is replicate the um, the time that they fought at the Battle of the Bulge, and that's what the Allied forces did do 
uh, with, their, with their tanks. Now, I believe my next slide, I want you now to focus on this. I showed you our interpretation slide. One of the things we try to do because we are a military museum, it's just in a few words and just in maps, give you some of that operation. So after the Allies win the Battle of the Bulge, uh, let me see what my time is. Great, doing great. Um, win the Battle of the Bulge, which on this map is right here. So let me go to my next slide. Uh, it's right here. Again, for the next several months, they are in pursuit and pushing the Germans. Now they're in Germany, so this is a difference. And we'll talk about how do they get into Germany after the Battle of the Bulge. I think that's my next two or three slides. And then we're gonna talk about this horrible encountering at Falkenau, uh, one of the German labor camps. So after the Battle of the Bulge, the Allies are not finished. The Germans had been working, so had the French, the Maginot Line, uh, created, uh, born out of World War I, created in the 1930s because Europe being what a country, uh, or the Europe uh, being what America is not, a landlocked country, we have the greatest defense because we have this large tank ditch called the Atlantic Ocean. In Europe, you don't have that. So countries were building these fortified lines. The French built a line called the Maginot Line, and the Germans built one called the Siegfried Line. And so now we're gonna talk about the Siegfried Line to Falkenau. So now let's go back to the map and put on our tactical operational hat again. And so remember, this is where the uh, first ID was. You can see that bulge, that salient is just going back it's going back, it's going back, and by January, the Germans are back on their border. If you can see my pointer, the first ID is located right here. If you look at this little pink line, ladies and gentlemen, this is the German Siegfried line, and we always read about that and we always hear about that, but I put a few pictures up because sometimes a picture, at least for me, um, I do a lot of reading, but I like reading books with pictures, a picture tells a lot of words. At the top, you can see an aerial view of what the Maginot Line looked like. 310 miles, give or take, from the border of the Netherlands to uh, the Swiss border. And if you look at the bottom, now you get the magnitude of the size of those teeth, those dragon teeth, I believe what they, they call them. Um, and you see a tank. Not only were those barriers there. There were tunnels, uh, there was barbed wire, there was a defensive wall that the Allies had to break through. So when you hear it takes um, several weeks for the Allies to break through this uh, Siegfried line, we're not just talking about pushing through at one location, which you can do and we did do, and that creates a foothold, it's more than a 300 and some odd uh, mile long Siegfried line. And so after the Battle of the Bulge, the German army is pretty much defeated. Matter of fact, when we fight in the Battle of the Bulge, it is no longer the crack soldiers that the Germans had in 1940, 1941, and 1942. Matter of fact, there are airmen in the German army fighting as infantrymen during the Battle of the Bulge. That's how bad it was. Older men and younger men who would not have been used as soldiers just three years prior were fighting in the Battle of the Bulge. And although I often use this term, uh, strategic consumption for the American forces, which means you are losing some of your combat power, and we were, that's why we started recruiting um, African Americans to be infantrymen in 1945, we still had a supply of men to use. And it partly goes back to what I showed in our, our earlier slide, because women were serving in all branches of the service in different auxiliaries, and the one single mission of all women units was to free a man to fight. And I didn't show you that, that interpretation. That's one of the six interpretations that we put up since I've been here. We put up a interpretation about women in World War II, and it's called Free a Man to Fight. And so 
we as the allies, although we were reaching some level of strategic consumption, if you want to use that term, after um, D-Day, we still had the ability to create um, the munitions, uh, to build up our weaponry, and also to get more men. And so by uh, mid-February, I believe it is, we break through the Maginot Line. But just look at those images and, and, and how deceiving the aerial shots may look. Okay, so now let's go where I want to spend a little time to try to tailor uh, this presentation to uh, our friends uh, who invited us to speak. And I was asked to speak, this is before the pandemic. I love to be in, in person, so I, I don't know um, how everything is going on your end, but I'm having fun on my end. So it's great that we can interpret the Holocaust and Nuremberg trial in this museum. And the reason is because we have the first ID and soldiers who were a part of some of those men all throughout Germany who came upon concentration camps um, and labor camps. And so you're looking at a man, his name is Samuel Fuller. Some of you may know him as a filmmaker. That's the same guy in the bottom right hand corner. But Sam Fuller was a corporal in the United States Army during World War II, serving in the first ID when they got into camp. Like I said, you know, put on my teacher's hat. You know, sometimes we like to read from books when we're in class. So I just want to read you how this man who was 29 years old, who had already had a screenplay, who actually had already written a book, um, but it did not get published until he was already in the war. I think it, the publication date is 1944 because he wrote the book. And when he left in 1941, uh, but by the time he deployed, it was 42. Uh, he gave it to his mother and it did get published. He was actually in theater seeing soldiers reading his book. But let, let, let me read this and, and just pick up a few things uh, how uh, this guy became an infantryman. Uh, since we were all treated like crap, I'm sanitizing the word, there's another word in the book, um, a healthy camaraderie, he's talking about training with these men, this is when he joins, after he joins, developed among the recruits an affinity that went beyond social and educational boundaries. You named the ethnic background. We had it, Irish, Polish, Jewish, Italian, matter of fact, he was of Jewish descent. He changed his name, wasn't Fuller. Uh, his parents' name was at Fuller when he came, when they came to America, I believe in the late 1920s. Italians, Latinos, Armenians, Slavs, except blacks. At that time, blacks got sent to their own regiment. The guys grunting alongside of me came from every walk of life, from cities, from towns, and from villages across America most with rudimentary education. And I'll move down further. In the second training camp, I ran into an officer I knew, Kenneth Cox, and Kenneth Cox recognized him, and I'm gonna paraphrase a little because there's three more paragraphs, recognized who he was, offered him a, a lieutenancy, took him to see the general, and they offered him a lieutenancy, uh, lieutenancy being a second lieutenant. Um, and when they offered it to him, he said, I don't do publicity. He snarled, you know, I joined the army to be an infantryman. And he goes on to say, how many times would I regret that decision? But here's a guy who was 29 years old. He wasn't a 19, 20, 21 year old recruit. He was already uh, at an educational level and probably could have came in as an officer. But just like when you go back to McCormick uh, at his social status le uh, level in World War I, wanting to serve uh, this is what Fuller wanted to do. So let's move on to another page here uh, where he says, uh, and this is key for later on, the tough physical routine and the monotony of training were getting to me. The camps were morbid. Hell, I wanted some real soldiering, tired of being overworked. I began to have nightmares. This is in training. I regret not writing those nightmares down. 
because they were straight out of mysterious inner eyes that I had. Perfect for a future novel or movie, I thought. I remember one which was uh, me in a German village with Nazi signs in place and seeing people starving. Unbeknownst to me, that nightmare would come true. And so that nightmare does come true. And before I finish this up, let me go back to some of the things I talked about earlier. Samuel Fuller was a three invasion veteran. He's one of those few soldiers who landed on North Africa, who landed on Sicily, and who landed on Normandy and came back and survived the war and had a great career in, in filmmaking. Um, and so I don't want to talk about all that. Let's talk about his experience. And I, I like to read these things because I can always tell the stories, but sometimes reading it from the book uh, just brings it home. We moved into Falconau that night and were slapped hard in the face, first by hordes of German screaming into the town from Karls Karlsbad, fleeing the Russian army because they wanted to surrender to Americans. There were thousands of soldiers, many accompanied by their wives and children. More than 45,000 POWs moved through Falkenau in the next three days, creating a monumental job, one that we could barely handle. The most profound shock, shock, however, awaited us as we entered the front gates of Falkenau concentration camp, only a few thousand yards from the town. That's key to remember. Only a few thousand yards, not three, four miles, but a few thousand miles, yards from the town where it was surrounded by barbed wire and barriers. And between the camp's two towers was this huge sign, and I don't speak German, but he writes it in here. I'll do my best. Concentration Slugger. And I forget to tell you, you know, when I talk about the Battle of the Bulge, I love that my first three years in the Army, I was a lieutenant in Eiffel, um, right several kilometers from the Battle of the Bulge. I've seen some of the uh, uh, remnants of the Siegfried line and the Maginot line so when i read this history it, it's interesting that i spent a lot of time in the field as a second lieutenant first lieutenant as well um when i was stationed in germany in the in the late 1980s so let's continue on and then he goes on to say then we discovered the horrible truth the horrible truth about the camp in the barracks were men and women with hollowed eyes, unable to move their emancipated bodies. They'd been tortured, beaten, and experimented upon. What had been happening here in this concentration camp was beyond belief, beyond our darkest nightmares. Remember, he had had nightmares four years prior. We were overwhelmed to come face to face with all the carnage. I still tremble, and he wrote this book in 2002. I still tremble as I remember those images of living hunkered down among the dead. The stench of rotting bodies welled up in our face and made you want to stop breathing. In one building, we plopped down behind a white mound looking for and hiding from remnants of Germans, only to realize it was teeth which had been wrenched from the bodies of the victims. One final horror awaited us, the crematorium. I stared at the ovens, and then I looked into the first oven. When I saw the remains of a cremated body in there, I couldn't control my revulsion, I vomited. But instead of leaving, I couldn't. So I looked in the second oven, and I looked in the third oven. For Christ's sakes, people had actually been cooked in those ovens. Proof, 
of the Holocaust. And there's some more we can read, ladies and gentlemen. But remember, he had been a filmmaker, amateur before the war. His mother sent him a small 30 millimeter camera. Let me check my time, great. Um, the captain went to the town of his unit and questioned the, booker, the butcher, the baker, the teacher, all the professionals. No one knew what was going on in Falconau, just a few um, yards away. So what he did, he rounded them up and he made them come and witness what was just over the mound of their town. He made them clean up the dead, give them a proper burial. And he ordered Corporal Fuller, don't you have a camera? Fuller went up on the hill and he filmed for 20 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. We show seven minutes of that film here uh, of a first ID soldier, evidence of what was going on. And so it doesn't end there for the first infantry division in this saga of inhumanity. Uh, you come out where you see the tank and you see we have a door of the Nuremberg trial. That is one of the doors that was at Nuremberg. We interpret Nuremberg. And one of the reasons we can also interpret Nuremberg here at the first ID and other ways that most military museums can't because we do have a direct connection. Another big red one soldier, a guy by the name of James Sharp, he was a security guard at the Palace of Justice. Uh, he also wrote a book uh, that's an image of him. And let's look at like, this soldier, that soldier. You see other soldiers with different patches. There were four countries, England, uh, France, uh, Russia, and the US. You see the big red one soldiers with their guard patches on. And so, Let's talk about this. This is inter interesting um, as well, you know, just to read. So, you know, to be a guard at the Nuremberg trial was a select position. You didn't just say, hey, you Salter, you're gonna be a guard. You had to apply to be a guard. You had to meet certain standards and you had to meet a cut. And this is what he says. There were five requirements to be accepted just for the interview. You must have had to be an NCO, non-commissioned officer. You had to have combat experience. I mean, you fought as an infantryman, mainly. Uh, some artillery and other soldiers who had combat experience became guards as well. Uh, you had to understand military protocol and the Geneva Convention and the rules of war for POWs. You must commit to staying on duty for three months. This is key. Um, and you had to be recommended by your commander. Of the initial 12 sergeants of the guards, he was one of only the first six that was uh, selected. And as we know, the trial went on for just over a year. Um, and this is interesting um, to read. The first, and he talks about his experiences, and he talks about when he first saw these prisoners. There were 21 prisoners, one committed suicide, which is why the the doors are very key. A light had to be sh uh, sh uh, on the prisoners because they needed to be kept safe so they could face what they did in trial. And so he says, when I first saw the defendants up close in the exercise yard during my training and orientation, I was observing them from atop an ancient prison wall surrounded, uh, surrounding the entire palace of justice. I was amazed, I was amazed. I originally thought these men would look like sadistic monsters or something similar because these were the leaders of the Third Reich now accused of the most dreadful crimes. The same Nazis I had, so he's younger than Fuller, the same Nazis I had read about in high school have been taught about in high school and at Topeka. He was one of the replacements that came in December 44. So he didn't even land on D-Day. So he was in high school when he learned about a lot of this. And then he goes on to say, but when I saw them in the exercise yard for the first time, it was a shock. It was a shock as they were neatly dressed, strolling and visiting in small groups. My first thought was they look 
just like ordinary men. They look just like ordinary men. Now, I spoke at the Holocaust Museum several weeks ago. Full disclosure, I used to teach the final solution as a part of some of my classes at West Point and Command and General Staff College uh, starting in 1936. This group knows what the final solution is. Um, but, you know, I always want to increase my education. So when I spoke at the Holocaust Museum, I asked, I said, I, you know, I want to increase my education. Just give me some information on some new books. One of my friends there, Kelly, recommended this book to me. What's the title of that book? Ordinary Men. And so I, I've been reading it on and off, like most of us probably on this, reading too many books at once. It talks about how ordinary men became what they became. Some of these men who were a part of this uh, crime against humanity in 41, definitely 42, 43, and 44, in 1937, 38, 39, 40, a lot of them were ordinary men. This book has uh, opened up my eyes in some different ways. And when we think about, you know, what's going on in different places of the country, uh, crowd, um, um, what's the word, peer pressure, you know, some of these ordinary men for different reasons, and the book points them out. Uh, become what they became. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have about uh, 10 minutes to answer questions I probably can't answer, but I'll do my best. If I, if I can't answer it, I'll make up something. No, I'm just joking. So that really concludes the uh, formal presentation. Um, and so I'm open to Q&A. Let me make sure that's my last slide. Yep, it was. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, thank you. This is Linda. Thank you again um, for sharing the amazing st uh, history of the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, that was a great overview and I think you uh, wet, wet the interest of many both to continue learning and to come visit your museum. Uh, one of the questions that came in <clears throat> is, um, if someone wanted to know, is there additional archive information and interviews in the BRO holdings, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, that we can look at at your museum or on an invitation basis? Absolutely. So uh, let me back up one slide, hopefully. Okay, so you look at the bottom of the slide. That's our website. So the good thing about this museum is we also have a research center and library, which is not a part of our title, and it's one of the things, uh, part of my initiative to get at it. So right down below me, as a matter of fact, we are the institution, a diamond in the rough, that has the largest collection of archives associated with first infantry division collections. So we do have uh, information downstairs associated uh, with all aspects, uh, first ID actions uh, from World War I to World War II, which is also inclusive of soldiers' uh, names and information um, and, and what they did. As far as specific videos, I would be willing to bet, I've only been here, like I said, for 14 months. We have archives of videos. I would be willing to bet that some of those World War II interviews and some of the videos we have. But the reason I point you to our website, uh, first, uh, Eric Gillespie is our director of the Research Center. You will see his name on there. And there is a gentleman named Andrew Woods, uh, just a rock star, our, our researcher. He will be able to point you um, in the right direction. Then we have a librarian and an archivist and an assistant librarian who are all very knowledgeable. Um, I think the person who's been down there the least has been there for about nine years and both Andrew and Eric were pushing over 25 years. Go on our website, look up their information, and I'm gonna say it here, I guarantee you that they will be able to point you in the direction to find some of that information. No, terrific. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what would you say was the most significant turning point in the European theater of war? Yeah, it changes every day. 
Um, it changes every day, but I think the most significant point in the turning of the war, it's something that will, will surprise uh, some folks, but I think it was when they broke through the Siegfried line, even after D-Day, which was certainly a turning point, and even after the Battle of the Bulge, which was certainly a turning point. But when you break across somebody's border, um, I think that's a significant turning point. So today for this presentation, because that is the foothold that leads to uh, the Germans retreating, Germans taking their own lives um, before the war ended to include Hitler, Hitler, and three other senior generals uh, were on trial during the Nuremberg trial. Uh, a lot of people didn't know where some of them were. We know now uh, because we know that Hitler committed uh, suicide. So as I was preparing this presentation and looking more into my past studies and teachings of crossing the Siegfried line and getting to the Remagen Bridge and all those things, I think that was a significant uh, turning point as well. Great. I'll say it like Thank that you. as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question that goes back to uh, when you were talking about the soldiers who originally liberated the camp. Um, someone would like to know, uh, were those soldiers able to help some of the camp survivors? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, and Yes and no, I, and I'm thinking of several different stories. I like not to tell too many, so I, there, there's one that pops in my mind because unfortunately the soldier um, helps this individual in a specific way. Um, there were these people who were so emaciated, um, you can tell whether they were 19 or 39. You can tell whether they were 19 or 39. You could pick them up like a feather. And there's this one story I read where um, <clears throat> this soldier, they had been there for three days and they were still, you know, um, you know, cleaning, I guess I will say, uh, some of the buildings. And a soldier heard this moan, this moan. And he jerked around and he looked and there was this head sticking up. It was a person that was still alive. She happened to be a young woman. Um, he began to nurse her back to health, um, did all he did. He had been an infantryman. Uh, he was shirking off, if you will, on some of his other duties, but no one cared because he put all of his energy in bringing this woman back to life. But it was evident to a lot of people, to include the doctors, that she could not be brought back to life. And so unfortunately, she did die several days into that. Uh, he found a nice dress, some shoes, gave her a proper burial. He would not let anyone else help him bury her. So you say, well, she died. How did he help her? Uh, for several days. For several days. He saw a smile on this young woman's face. It's a very touching story, sir. And okay, I'm looking for, for some sharing. more questions. I still have uh, five minutes here. But um, you know, that's, that's a part of humanity. Um, and the way the story ends, is no matter what she experienced and how long she was there, uh, she died with some level of joy. So the next question that's come in is, um, can you share any stories of how the liberators were affected afterwards? By the experience of liberating the camps, and are those the stories that, mm -hmm, that have yeah, the liberators of the soldiers? You're talking about the soldiers? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is 
And I'll, I'll, you know, one of my things about military history, being a military historian and an African American, I decided a long time ago that I wanted to look into the social, cultural, political, and economic and intellectual aspects of being a soldier. And so minority groups, so I'll share a story, not about a first ID individual to answer that one. Uh, this soldier happens to be an Asian Pacific American soldier. He was a Japanese American soldier who fought in the 442nd uh, Infantry Battalion, but actually he wasn't in the Infantry Battalion. He was in their, I think it was, it was their artillery unit because in the last part of the uh, war, the 442nd Infantry soldiers stay in Italy but their artillery unit is attached into Germany, used as artillery on order, if you will. So there were Japanese Americans who went into concentration camps with some of the units that they were supporting. And I remember reading this one story a while ago where this Japanese American soldier who had been a draftee later on because he was drafted out of our own internment camps and the poignantness of his perspective on going into the concentration camps as opposed to some of the white Americans who joined the military uh, from a free hometown or were drafted from a free hometown. <clears throat> he realized two things, how bad it was, and he understood what it was like to lose your freedom because he was drafted out of the internment camp. But also, he, he understood the differences of uh, humanity. There's never a way to compare and contrast uh, things in history. The internment camps in this country in World War II, in my opinion, were horrific. Uh, but what some of those Nisei soldiers realized, uh, that there was a different level of horror. Um, and when he went back home and he was able to get his family, his parents mainly out of the concentration camps, I think it was, or internment camps. And in this country, we call them, it depends on where you, what you're reading. There is a study that calls them concentration camps and a study that calls them internment camps. It affected him um, in, in different ways than it affected some of his white counterparts because he had an idea what it was like to just lose your freedom overnight. And that's what happened with Executive Order 9066, I believe that one was, mm -hmm. which was passed in February of 1942. And in a matter of six weeks, Americans, because Nisei were American citizens, unlike they, their Issei parents, uh, since they were born in America, they were citizens and they lost their citizenship and their freedom overnight. So it affected all of them, and the, so the story I told you was a white soldier. And then I've read stories of African American soldiers who were in support of units that came to these camps. And it, it affected each soldier in a different way, but in a horrific way. And most of those soldiers were committed to social justice and equality uh, who were closer to this than many other soldiers, not all, but most. Uh, Dr. Salter, I want to be mindful of your time, and you said you need to. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take one more. I do have a meeting that's going to, it's an internal meeting, but they know I'm doing this. I'll, I'll take one more. And, you know, this is, a, I'm not a big, big fan of doing virtual, but I, I mean, I, I do like to, I do well, like when I get you. to stand in the classroom. This feels like a classroom a little bit. <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here. The last question is if you could share a little bit about the first division and um, you've talked a lot about African-American soldiers serving. Were they uh, part of the liberation here or what role did they have towards the end of the war? Okay, so it's a question about African-American soldiers? Correct. <clears throat> okay, yeah, great. So yeah, it's um, now this goes to the points after D-Day and going to the Battle of the Bulge, um, the Allied casualty rate was very high. And then as some units during the Battle of the Bulge, it was high as well. So they were getting short of men. Um, in some cases, the pipeline from the US was not fast enough. So what they did is we were in a segregated military and most African-Americans who wanted to fight as infantrymen 
were relegated and segregated to the SOS units. The reason you don't have a lot of African American uh, as fighters in World War II is not because they didn't want to fight, it's because our government put them in those segregated units. On December 26, 1944, Eisenhower put a memorandum out recruiting African Americans in these service and support units who wanted to fight as infantrymen. No matter what your rank was, and there were some officers who did this, you had to take a reduction in rank to become a private. Why? So you could not outrank the white soldiers that you were going to be attached to. In, ninth, in February, January and February 1945, they went through training. They were sent out to the 12 uh, division size elements. Some were infantry. I think there were nine or 10 infantry and three or two armored divisions. And they fought as infantrymen. Um, and so that's how they get into those units. Uh, there were 12 uh, division size units. The first ID was one. Uh, I'm the one that's going to write that interpretation. And there's a couple other interpretations I, I work on as well. Um, and so that's who they were. They earned CIBs. The sad thing is shortly after the war was over, they wanted to stay with their units. I'm more in tune with the soldiers in the first ID because I've been reading a lot of that. And we have some of that stuff downstairs in the archives. But they um, were sent back to their units. And when they came back to America, they still served in a segregated America. The other group of African-American soldiers that served with the first ID, and they're already interpreted in the exhibition, is a lot of people, and I, I took it out of this, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff I could talk about. A lot of folks have seen that image of World War II of those uh, blimp looking balloons over D-Day. Those are called barrage balloons. The unit that operated those barrage balloons was the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. Write it down, there's books about them. They were an African American unit. And on some of the uh, LSTs in the first wave had five and six 320th Barrage Balloon soldiers. So if, when you hear were there African Americans on the first wave of D-Day, absolutely. And what units were they attached to? The 29th Infantry Division and the 1st Infantry Division. So that, that, that's who they were. That's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending this hour and helping us to better understand the history of the first ID and really to inform and deepen our understanding of the events that happened during World War II. We are grateful to you. I also want to thank all of you uh, who tuned in. We are grateful that you are here. In the chat box, you will see that we've put up a brief survey. We're grateful if you would take a moment and fill it out. This is how we know how our programs are um, being received and also how we can communicate with our funders. So it's very important we get your feedback. I also want you to know that we've put a link to our events page so that you can um, continue your learning with us. There's lots of wonderful programming up there and we hope to see you again. Thank you all again so much. Okay, thank you for the invite. It's been fun. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye.